Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Nobody complained last time, so they asked me to come back. <laughs> <laughs> At least I don't think they complained. <laughs> Just watch that clock. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. And it's so good that we serve a compassionate God who the Bible tells us that he was a man acquainted with sorrows and griefs. And uh, it's good to serve a compassionate God that feels what we're going through. So let us open to the book of Ephesians. I'm going to be reading from chapter 2. What God put on my heart to read. Do you remember last time I read Ephesians chapter 1? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Okay. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The Spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. May God bless his word this morning in our hearts. Um, I'm going to be reading, I'm going to be taking one verse or two at a time, and then elaborate or explaining each one as I go along, as we go along. I've titled this message, from walking dead to spirit life. <laughs> and uh, the opening verse, which says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. If you are a born again Christian this morning, that is exactly the change that has taken place in your life. You were once dead in your trespasses and sins. Paul says in Ephesians 2 1, meaning that you were spiritually dead because of sin. Going back to Genesis. Chapter 2, 16 and 17, God commands Adam, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Then in chapter 3, Satan slithers onto the scene and tells them otherwise, You will not certainly die. When Adam and Eve decided willfully to listen to Satan's voice rather than their creator's. Their disobedience led to a disconnection of their spirit to God. And that disconnection is exactly what Paul's referring to when he states, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And from that moment on, mankind has been born spiritually dead. The Greek word for dead used in the passage is nekros, which literally means corpse, or dead body. Contrary to Darwinism, our bodies are not evolving, but decaying and returning back to dust. Paul calls our physical bodies bodies of death. In Romans 7, 2, 4, he asks, What a wretched man am I? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Have you ever heard the saying, a moment on the lips is a lifetime on the hips. <laughs> In other words, if you're a junk food junkie, there'll be long-lasting physical consequences. Well, in Adam and Eve's case, in their disobedience to God, 
Their moment on the lips has caused the history of humanity to be, both, to be one of three deaths. Wow. Spiritual death, physical death, and eternal death. And Peter says in Hebrews 9.27, people are destined to die once, physically speaking, and after that, the judgment. Matthew 25, 46 states, then they will go to eternal punishment. Death and, death and sin go hand in hand. Paul says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. And James says in chapter 1.15, sin gives birth to death. And this is why we should take sin more seriously. It still wreaks heavy consequence. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Back to the, the verse. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so who is responsible for all this? The blinding of the minds of unbelievers. Satan is. But when we were spiritually dead, we followed his every command. Satan, the great deceiver, the prince of lies, the lord of this world. He knew very well that if he could cut off our spiritual ties with our creator, we could no longer have a desire to reconnect with them. And if you want evidence of this, go and talk of spiritual matters to a non-believer, of Jesus and of the Bible, or simply the possibility of the existence of a creator, or abstinence before marriage. Or think back to a time before you were a Christian, and someone tried to talk to you about spiritual truths. There was a spiritual disconnect because we were dead. Asking a non-believer if he's hungry for spiritual truths is like asking a corpse if he wants a happy meal. It just doesn't happen. 1 John 5.19 says the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Can we see Satan in his kingdom? Can we see Satan in his kingdom? No. But can we see the influence that his kingdom has over the visible realm? Job 1.7 says, The Lord asked Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. So although we don't see him, the Bible makes it clear that he's here and that his influence is ruling the visible world but he is doing it from an unseen realm. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The devil is no longer in heaven. The heavenly places mentioned here is referring to the unseen realm. Satan's influence is in the air. The spirit of the Antichrist is working in the sons of disobedience. Who are the sons of disobedience? Let us continue reading to find out. Chapter, I mean, verse 3, Ephesians chapter 2. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. In this verse, Paul is letting us know that we're, we're, we were all walking dead at one point in time. We weren't any better than the rest of them. People ask, Often, why would God allow evil in the world? If he's so good, they say, then why won't he put an end to all of this war and suffering and evil? Totally excluding themselves from any of the blame, from any of the blame, which is arrogance and blasphemy. I'll explain. Arrogance because they don't include themselves as part of the problem, the sin problem in the world. And blasphemy because they are accusing God who can't sin and who hates sin for the sin that lies in the heart of man. In the famous love passage found in 1 Corinthians, we read that love suffers long. Now here is Paul, here is what Paul has to say about that in Romans. Romans chapter 9, verse, you don't have to turn there, but I'll read it to you. Uh, chapter 9, verse 22 and 24 says, What if God although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepared for destruction. What if he did this to make 
the riches of his glory known to the subjects of his mercy, to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory. Okay, I've spent enough time on the three enemies, ourselves, the internal enemy, the world, the external enemy, and Satan, the infernal enemy. Now let's get to the good news. Ephesians verses, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Just when the God of this age thought he had made it impossible for us to connect to our Creator, to reach out to God, God reached out to us. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, in the King James Version, puts it this way. Even when we were dead in sins, God hath quickened us together with Christ. Mm -hmm. By grace he was saved. And the word quickeneth, what, is that, what does that mean, God quickeneth, quickeneth us together with Christ? It means to reactivate, to reanimate, to give or restore life to. We see the same word used in John 5, 21, where it says, for, the Father, for as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. And also in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. So Adam was living, was a living soul, meaning that he had life, but he could not, he could not give life or restore life. But he, he lost it by trespassing God's command. All mankind inherited spiritual death because of it. They go through life, but they do not possess life. The second Adam, Jesus, came to restore life to mankind, being a quickening spirit. Verses 6 and 7. And God raised us up. And God raised us up with Christ. And seated us with Him in the heavenly realms. In Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages, He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. How has God raised us up with Christ and seated us in heavenly places, heavenly realms of Christ Jesus? Well, in uh, Paul's prayer at the end of chapter 1, uh, verse, verse uh, 19, he says, It was according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The working of his mighty power. The same power that he rose Christ from the dead is the power that he's... He's made us raise up to heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. How can it's resurrection power by the Holy Spirit? How can we be sure of this? Romans 8 10 says, But if Christ is in you, then even your body is subject to death because of sin. Then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. In Romans 8 11, and if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Mm -hmm. He that raised Christ up from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells inside of us. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 and 14 says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him. You were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. We have this seal, the Holy Spirit, that promises this. So God has made it 
and very well known to us so that we don't have to have doubts, we don't have to worry. We know where we're going when we trust in Christ. Mm -hmm. And because God's outside of time, He doesn't see things the way we see them, He sees everything. It reminds me a bit of when He was taking His time to go see Lazarus, and, and it took Him two days, and because God's outside of time, this time where we're waiting is like that period. It's like that period where, you know, our mortal bodies have to be have to be resurrected bodies. And for God, that two days it took him to go see Lazarus, where he says, I am the resurrection, is like the time now that it's taking for us waiting for our bodies of death to reconnect to our Savior, even though right to be renewed, actually. It's not going to be the same body. Our resurrection bodies. Because the body of sin, the carnal body, the earthly body, cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. It has to be made a spiritual body. Paul knows full well that Satan and the natural man have the same mind. Our internal enemy would like to take credit for the things of God, just like that proud spirit of old, the infernal enemy. So again, he reiterates, verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 2, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Verse 9, not by works, so that no one can boast. And Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin, we know this verse, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. In Galatians 6.14, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of Christ. Our saving grace and the works that follow are the work of Christ and Christ alone. And for a minute, I'd like to go back to Paul's prayer in prison. In Ephesians 1.19, he prays that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened, in order that we may, we may know the hope to which he has called us, the riches of his glory and inheritance in the saints. Paul knows that even though we are positionally in heavenly places, we're still on the earth. In the meantime, we have to deal with the three enemies, the internal, the external, and the infernal. His prayer is that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened by a renewed mind, the mind of Christ. Our earthly eyes need to consult our heavenly head, which is Christ Jesus. And Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And Ephesians 4, 17 through 18 says, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. And now I've, we've, we've come to the last verse of Ephesians. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In this letter, Paul refers to himself as the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of the Gentiles. Paul could have easily seen the situation the way it appeared to be. Look where my preaching has gotten me, back in jail, me and my big mom. <laughs> but no, he doesn't. If he had thought like that, if he had begun to mistake his situation for his position, we would not have this letter. But because Paul's confidence was in Christ, he was able to see his imprisonment as God's purpose. And for 2,000 years, Christians have been feasting on this letter as our meat and potatoes. But when we look at our situation and believe what we see, we're fooling ourselves, and Satan loves that. Because we discourage ourselves from walking in the works God has planned before. Our position, regardless of where we are situated on earth, is in heavenly places. Do you remember before Pilate handed Jesus to be crucified? He said to him, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And what did Jesus say? He responded, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Perhaps 
Man has put Paul in prison, but man would not have had the power to put Paul in prison if that power over him had not been given to him from God. For each member of the body of Christ is God's handiwork. And if we too begin to look at our situation as given by God, rather than by man, we will then begin to walk in the works that he's prepared for us to do in advance. Praise God. Thank you so much for listening. I think that is our final prayer. Is it final prayer? You can close us in prayer. Okay, well, we're going to have communion, so stick around. Thank you, God, for... Thank you, God, for all that you're doing, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for the men and women of God and the body of Christ that you've put on our hearts to, to be enlightened, to serve you, to love you, to glorify in you, to only boast in the cross of Christ, which is the finished work that we have to glory in until we come home. And in the meantime, Lord, help us to live lives that are dependent on our heavenly head, which is Christ Jesus. And let us now have communion together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, in the name of Christ Almighty. Amen. Amen.